Ms. Harris, Shadow Secretary of State, Chief Constable, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I extend a warm welcome to each of you to this, our 47th annual conference. Now, within the past five days, dissident Republican terrorists attempted to murder one of our colleagues at Shandon Park Golf Club. Here is an off-duty officer, a family man, singled out by people intent on causing anguish and pain, and of course, instilling fear amongst our colleagues and the wider community. And I'm sure that you will join with me in conveying our best wishes to him and indeed his family over this traumatic and contemptible act. <laughs> and the people who planned this attack, people who made the device, who planted it, who stole the vehicles and set them on fire and in order to help them in their escape, they have absolutely nothing to offer us. They are bankrupt and heartless. They are politically irrelevant and deserving only of our condemnation. They must be apprehended, and for that I appeal from this platform today for an all-out effort by all in our community to give them up, to rid us once and for all of the scourge that continues to blight this island. Now, 2019 will be characterised as a year of change in policing in Northern Ireland. The current Chief Constable he's counting down his days to his retirement, and waiting to step into the post is the former Chief Constable of Cheshire, Simon Byrne. Now, Mr Byrne has a wealth of policing experience behind him, and we look forward to working with him to deliver what's best for the wider community and our officers who serve the community. To our current Chief Constable, on behalf of the Police Federation of Northern Ireland, I want to extend to you and your family our best wishes for the future. Our relationship was always constructive, sometimes challenging, but at all times in the best interests of our officers, and I wish you well. Now, in the absence of a Justice Minister, the Secretary of State recently announced the appointment of Marie Anderson as the new Police Ombudsman. We have had a strained relationship with the current Ombudsman, where we have consistently highlighted a biased viewpoint towards serving and retired officers. We accept the Office of Ombudsman has to have the confidence of the public, but crucially, also of the police. It is not an unreasonable expectation that pony investigations are conducted thoroughly and impartially. Colleagues, in the past, confidence that this has been done has been in very short supply. But we will engage with Mrs Anderson in a constructive manner and sincerely hope that the relationship with that office can be improved. So the policing landscape is changing and will change some more in the coming months, and there are significant issues to confront and address, all of them requiring clear leadership and direction. One area that continues to have a major impact on our officers is workplace wellbeing. Our wellbeing project is now in its third year, and the results have been heartening. And at the same time, they underline the need for intervention. We all acknowledge the simple fact that we have a problem, and it is a challenge that must be confronted without further delay. Recently, Police Care UK commissioned the University of Cambridge to carry out research, and the results confirmed our worst fears. Their survey found that 90 per cent of those employed in policing in the United Kingdom are exposed to trauma, and one in five of those reported symptoms of PTSD. And from our own workforce survey, PSNI officers scored lower for mental health wellbeing relative to the Northern Ireland population. Our £1 million wellbeing initiative is well received and is welcomed by our members. It is filling a void that exists because of a lack of funding and is now being rectified by the recruitment of 20 mental health professionals by the PSNI, which is wholeheartedly welcomed. Preventative measures, early intervention and individual support are key goals. But we must also see improvements in workplace wellbeing, which show that it is OK not to be OK. Immediate action is required on the big issues, issues of workforce size, resilience, demand and adequate rest and recuperation. Our people who suffer from conditions such as PTSD, they need to know that the help is there and will be delivered in a timely, professional and caring manner, without the excruciating stranglehold of bureaucracy and before they are reduced to no pay. Talking of pay, I told you last year that there were shortcomings and failings in the pay review process. And once again, these independent recommendations have been ignored by the Home Office and the Department of Justice. Colleagues, 
What is the point of going to the trouble of compiling them and then submitting evidence in relation to pay when it is cast aside like this? Even the more fact-based case is agreed by the pay review body, the only test or criteria that is applied by government is one of affordability. Now, not surprisingly, we are now at the point where we lack confidence in a process that is anything but consistent. Our officers have now experienced two consecutive years where we have had significant delays in the implementation of pay awards. Delays of seven and five months are totally unacceptable. Whether it is the absence of a justice minister or an executive, the foot dragging has to stop. It tells officers that they are not properly valued and it has a direct negative impact on morale. In our most recent workforce survey, nine out of ten officers pointed to the damage this was doing to their morale, and more than six out of ten said the delay had a negative financial impact for them. And given the unwavering commitment our officers give to serving society on a daily basis, this sorry state of affairs reflects badly on those who control the purse strings. And furthermore, I take no pleasure in saying that with the ongoing political statement in Northern Ireland, it is possible that this same problem will be encountered for a third year. We have asked for contingency plans to put in place now to ensure this does not happen, but frankly, I would not be optimistic of that happening. The retention of CRTP allowance, however, is the only bright spot in the horizon. It is just one example of how the PSNI and this federation can work together to solve areas of mutual concern. And we have to thank all those on the PSNI side for having the foresight to see where such an allowance would enable them to tackle management issues within the service whilst valuing their officers. Now, the needs and challenges of our members featured in our second, very detailed workforce survey, where our men and women reported what would be regarded anywhere else as intolerable workplace pressures. Almost three quarters of those who took part in our survey said that when the pressure builds, they are expected to work faster, even if it meant taking shortcuts. And they also said there were insufficient numbers in their team or unit for them to do their job properly. Over 80 per cent insisted they did not have enough officers to manage all the demands made on them as a team. And 59 per cent said they were unable to meet the conflicting demands on their time. And the knock-on effects on officer morale and the PSNI efficiency, well, they are obvious. 92 per cent believed that morale across the PSNI was low. Colleagues, there are consequences when people have to consistently work under such unrelenting pressures, when the very real threat of punitive disciplinary action being taken, if and when they get it wrong, is never far from their minds. And the feedback we are getting from the front line is disturbing and is worrying. In any other organisation, this would set alarm bells ringing. Yet, for some inexplicable reason, the silence is deafening in some government departments. Without urgent investment, further decline in service will be inevitable. We will see more officers under stress and reporting sick, more being injured, and more leaving for less demanding jobs. And if this, if this isn't bad enough, officers continue to be assaulted whilst doing their jobs. There was an increase in the number of assaults on our members last year. Around 600 were injured, which is about six times the number of people in this venue. All of us, that's all of us, have to get real about this problem. It's no longer just good enough to say it's just part of the job. It's not part of the job to have broken bones, detached retinas, nightmares or PTSD. And the only effective way of dealing with this appalling problem is for the courts to hand down realistic sentences to people who assault police officers. <laughs> sentences must serve as a deterrent. Make the would-be attacker think twice. Make him or her realise that a minimum jail term is the most likely outcome. <laughs> For too long, police officers perceive that the courts have been far too lenient with offenders. It's time to give police officers the protection they deserve. That's the very least society can deliver for the people who go the extra mile to protect them. And as if that isn't bad enough, to add to the burden, we have officers dealing with more than 20,000 cases a year involving people with mental health issues. The Northern Ireland Audit Office recently reported how that figure had more than doubled. Gaps in health care are being plugged by officers, with many taking off normal duties for hours on end to help vulnerable people. We are already under strength, and being the service of last resort or the safety net for unwell and vulnerable individuals is starting to take a heavy toll. There is a clear need for, long, for the long due an over overdue debate on mental health provision, the role of appropriately qualified healthcare professionals, financial resources and the unrealistic expectations that are placed on officers. 
a robust review is needed that seriously addresses this growing challenge, and it has to be pushed up the agenda. And on that, we welcome the news that full-time nurses will be employed in all our custody suites by April 2020. We also have serious concerns around the proposed plans for legacy and how we, as a society, deal with the past. There is a determined and concerted effort underway to rewrite the past, to demonise the security forces, and to downplay the actions of the killers, and to pretend their deeds were somehow legitimate or justified. They most certainly were not. They could never be anything other than barbaric, and we will never, ever tire of defending the good name and the reputation of men and women like you who prevented all-out anarchy and delivered the conditions for peace. And as if to prove relevance today, too often some of our politicians eulogise the cowardly actions of the past. To commemorate events such as the murder of two police officers 100 years ago in County Tipperary, it only helps to radicalise a new generation. Whether a murder took place 100 years ago, 40 years ago or 10 years ago, it was all wrong, and politicians need to be mindful of the message they send out to society. Politicians and civic leaders need to be more mindful of the rhetoric they use when de describing the past. Praising the actions of terrorists who murdered our colleagues does nothing to instil confidence in placing the here and now, or indeed the future. I say to them, your words have a direct impact on the lives of our officers, and more care should be taken when celebrating the illegal action of terrorist groups. This Federation has made its position and legacy well known. We are ever mindful of the pain and suffering inflicted in the families of hundreds of our colleagues, those who were murdered, and the thousands left with often appalling physical injuries and indeed psychological illnesses. It will come as no surprise to you to hear me say that in some quarters the position we adopted was met with a mixture of silence, indifference, or in a few instances, hostility. As police officers both serving and retired, we have never sought to be treated any differently than any other sections of our communities. A crime is a crime, no matter who committed it. However, there is a clear and concerted effort by some to lay all the blame for atrocities carried out by terrorist groupings at the door of the police and military. And we stated in our submission that this is totally unacceptable. They work tirelessly to create the space for peace to become a reality. Now, the proposed legislation on legacy institutions is flawed and is in need of a radical review. If it proceeds as currently envisaged, there will be many cases where there will be an absence of hard evidence and investigations will be based on conjecture, rumour and perception. Looking at terrible times from over 30 years ago through the prism of modern-day policing is not the way to bring closure to the families of victims from whatever quarter. It is perverse to set up institutions which will seek to investigate retired officers, while we already have agreed to release terrorists from prison, grant pardons and issue comfort letters. <laughs> and let's not forget also that decommissioning legislation enabled terrorist groups to destroy ballistic and forensic evidence. The hypocrisy of that is lost on no one, I would imagine, in this room. When we add all this together, it is obvious that the focus of funding and investigations will be, will, to, will be to hound retired and serving officers in the vain hope that widespread criminality will be found. There cannot be two different ev evidential thresholds. Those who cause the bloodshed and mayhem must not be allowed to escape justice simply because their actions are weighed against a less rigorous legal test. No doubt vast sums of money will be ploughed into a process that will not guarantee closure for families and will only pose more questions than answers. In the interim, the proposed defence of non-criminal police misconduct will lay the blame for procedural error at the feet of individuals who serve their community with distinction and no doubt open the door to further legal processes. To placate some, there is a very real prospect that those who defended the state and worked day and daily to defeat terrorism will be abandoned. We also run the risk of creating a new community of victims, former police officers, who will have to delve into their pensions and savings to mount their own legal defences. The imbalance of the accuser getting seemingly unlimited age, legal aid sorry, with the accused former officer left to have her own devices is not lost on anyone in this conference. That is wrong on every level. It is blatant discrimination. Colleagues, this is fundamentally unfair, and we call on the government to confine non-criminal police misconduct to the bin and to provide funding for those accused to be able to avail of early and adequate legal indemnity. The spectre of legacy surrounds everything we do as a police service today, 
But I'm a realist, and I have to recognise how the overhang of the past is a break on local politics. As a society, we have to find a path that takes us through this political maze if a public confidence is to be maintained at all. Now, you don't need me to tell you that loyalists and Republican and terrorism continues to blight our communities. We have had the appalling murders of Ian Ogle and Lyra McKee at the hands of loyalist and Republican terrorists, which called, caused widespread revulsion. These tragic and needless murders led to an outpouring of disgust and justifiable anger. Lear was a young journalist adjacent to police in the Craigan as they searched for weapons when a masked gunman appeared from the shadows and attempted to murder our colleagues. Let's be clear. The thousands of people who attended vigils and protests across the province spoke more pointedly than any words I could ever offer. These murders have led to unprecedented community unification. People united to say, not in our name. And when communities deliver a message as powerful as that, terrorism and its apologists should be dealt a devastating and terminal blow. All of us, you, me, our colleagues and the communities we serve, want to see an end to all terrorist groups. But policing on its own cannot deal with the paramilitary gangs. We need the support of communities and, of course, realistic resourcing levels to enable policing to be visible and work effectively in partnership. As we hopefully move to better days, it's crucial the government maintains the level of security funding that's ring-fenced to deal with Northern Ireland-related terrorism. This funding is essential to prevent further terrorist attacks and is necessary to enable the PSNI to keep the lid on the activities of these parasites. There is no disputing the fact that lives continue to be saved because these resources are available. But we need to put more officers back into communities. It is at that neighbourhood level that policing is most effective and adequate cognizance should be taken of this. And by doing it, we will be better equipped to work collaboratively with local communities to tackle crime and terrorism. There needs to be significant investment in this area of policing in order that we can see the tangible benefits of community confidence in the police and indeed the improved social conditions that this will bring. And as the chair of the staff association, I have to register my deep concern at the absence of a working assembly and executive. We have just had local government and European elections. Talks began, but progress could once again prove elusive. Stormont collapsed two and a half years ago in a well-documented blame game, and since then a state of paralysis has prevailed. We have no programme for government, no one to fight our corner for increased resources and, and, and uh, adequate numbers. It is a disgraceful state of affairs. Two and a half years of cold storage, and that's just led to drift and indecision. The job of repairing fences and getting back to legislating and running Northern Ireland should trump everything else. If politicians are to rebuild public trust and confidence, then they will have to move from their narrow sectional demands and instead consider the greater societal good. For the sake of this entire community, I would appeal to our politicians to re-establish the executive and do it as quickly as possible. Settle your differences inside Stormont and not outside it. It's time to end the shrill megaphone voices for what passes as local political engagement. Deliver what they want and what policing and society needs. The, mass, the vast majority of men and women I represent want to do the best they can and to the highest standards for this community. They are the first to step up whenever asked, the first to intervene to help, the first to put tiredness, exhaustion, fatigue and injury behind them in order to prevent the service from keeling over. Their commitment is not in question. It is not too much to demand that same level of commitment from government. As we face into a new era for policing, we have an opportunity to review how we do things and, in a policing world that is constantly evolving, look for new ideas, new people-friendly, people-centric ways of delivering policing that places our workforce front and centre. We can and must redefine things. It's time to restyle the workplace and put in place a new norm, a new arrangement that puts our rank and file at the heart of the organisation. An organisation that can be tough in tackling crime and terrorism, as well as caring and respectful of its people in this, the most challenging job of all. Thank you. <laughs> Conference, our speaker today, in the absence of a Justice Minister, is Tony Lloyd MP. Tony has been the Shadow Secretary of State for Northern Ireland since 2018, and he's the Labour Member of Parliament for Rochdale. He was previously MP for Stratford between 1983 and 2012. 
He was also the Police and Crime Commissioner for Greater Manchester between 2012 and 17, and he was the interim mayor of Greater Manchester, where he focused on policing priorities, such as building and strengthening partnerships, tackling antisocial behaviour, protecting vulnerable people, dealing effectively with terrorism, serious crime and organised criminality, <laughs> building confidence in policing services and indeed protecting the police service. I therefore feel that he is well qualified to speak on matters pertaining to policing in Northern Ireland. Tony, can I ask you to say a few words, please? Thanks uh, very much, Mark. And I, I should begin by issuing a, a, a genuine thank you to the PFNI for, for this in, invitation. I, I say that because, as Mark has said, I, I have some background in working very closely with, with, with the police. And my admiration and respect for those who don a policing uniform um, knows uh, no, no bounds. And I say that in, in the light that we know uh, the, this uh, attempted murder, this deliberate, calculated attempted murder of one of your colleagues, one of your comrades, over the weekend, was designed to drag Northern Ireland backwards. And um, that cannot be allowed. But my sympathies go out to the individual. Um, my, uh, my respect goes out to, to you and your colleagues, because I know that every one of you is expected to take that generalised risk on behalf of society. Um, and we must say that's not acceptable. It's not acceptable in any part of this United Kingdom of ours. It's not acceptable in the kind of world that we want to, to, to bring. Um, I said that as well in the recognition of the, uh, of the murder recently of, of Lyra McKee. I was at Lyra's funeral the, the other week. Um, a very sad occasion, and that of itself was devastating as an outrage, but I do want to, first of all, congratulate the PSNI for the work that is being done um, as a result of that, because that really does matter. Um, I also want to say this, though, of course, is that the intended victim was almost certainly, again, one of your colleagues, and that we should uh, bring to mind. Um, if I go back slightly, when the, the, uh, the bomb went off at the courthouse in, uh, in, in Derry, um, of course, at that time, um, and I say this quite rightly, the people who ran forward were your colleagues, people who were there to, to make the public feel secure at a time when people like myself would rightly have been running in the other direction, because that's what we expect of our blue light services, but foremost um, amongst them, of course, is, is policing. So we expect a lot uh, of our policing service. Um, we expect a lot, I think, of the PSNA in particular. You've been on uh, a, a, a journey over the, the years since the PSNA was formed. It's a very different institution to its, its predecessors. Um, change comes, again, uh, a new chief constable. Um, I actually do want to, at this point, place on record my own thanks, my own recognition of the work of the, uh, the existing Chief Constable finishes at the end of this month, but a, a real thank you on behalf of the whole of our nation for the work that uh, George has done uh, for the people of Northern Ireland, but actually for the people of the whole of the United Kingdom over his, his years of service and, and the role as Chief Constable. But a new Chief Constable is on his way in, um, a new a police board. Um, I must say in passing, I think it was disgraceful that the police board didn't exist uh, for a time, and I'll come on to that in a moment, uh, uh, a new uh, policing ombudsman. And um, Mark, uh, you're absolutely right to say that these, these structures are all part of the structures of accountability that modern policing has to um, be, be part of, uh, um, to embrace, not necessarily always to fall in love with, but to, to embrace, because accountability, transparency, is at the very centre of what modern policing is all about. Um, po policing in the end, um, I know of no police officer who's ever told me I'm wrong on this because I learnt this from police officers. Policing has to be centred in communities. It has to be neighbourhood policing. The best kind of policing, whether it's solving uh, persistent bike crime, whether it's solving the, the, uh, the theft of ATMs, whether it's solving um, the most serious crimes, organised criminality, uh, whether it's about terrorism, um, is successful when it's embedded and located in that neighbourhood 
that community police. And that's the model of policing I believe in. It's the model of policing that makes a difference in, um, in the Greater Manchester, where the, the, the situation of organised crime is not dissimilar to the kind of issues you face uh, here in, in Northern Ireland. Um, it still is embedded in that local knowledge, that local police structure. And that matters enormously, I think, because in the end, that neighbourhood policing only works if the public has confidence in what our police service does. And that's something that is not simply precious. It's an asset that where you've got it, um, you cherish it, and where it's not there strong enough. And we know in all parts of our, our, our societies, come to Greater Manchester, I know of areas where young people still find it difficult to, to trust to work with the police. We've, you face similar kinds of challenges, and we've got to work together to overcome those challenges. But confidence in policing matters. And that's why those things that jolt that confidence are, are so difficult. And Mark, you've referred to legacy. And you're absolutely right, legacy still carries a heavy burden in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm very conscious of the, the, the challenge of that legacy, in particular when we look at the, 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 the need for historical investigations, the, the question of this historical investigations unit. I think that is best done separate from the PSNI, I must say, if that's uh, uh, because in the end, uh, first of all, I think there is genuinely enough to be doing in modern policing in Northern Ireland that the PSNI ought to be that dedicated force for the here and now, um, but also as well actually separating the investigation of the past um, from investigation of the present keeps the PSNI in a very different position in those issues. Um, but there are things, that, there are challenges from the past. And uh, again, Mark, I agree with you. There can never be any suggestion of equivalence between, um, uh, be, between things that happened over that time, the, the actions that were committed by paramilitary groups, by terrorists, were just that. They are illegal um, by the very nature. They still deserve investigation. But I do want to say this, and this is always quite a difficult argument. We know there's a growing demand, probably more centred around um, our armed forces rather than policing, interestingly, um, around the question of statute of limitations. Um, I don't believe that we should have a statute of limitations for the, those crimes of the past, those most serious crimes of the past. And I'll tell you why, partly, it, like everybody in this room, I've sat down and listened to victims of the most horrendous crimes um, over the years. Victims, um, uh, their families, uh, when, uh, um, uh, deserve, um, that, to deserve a, a knowledge that the judicial process is there to support them in their own journeys through life. Victims, I think, a victim-centred policy does matter. Making sure our processes are victim-centred really does matter. But I think there's a bigger issue at stake, and it is about reputation. I think it's right and proper to say that the overwhelming majority of, of police officers who went out to uphold the law, who went out to serve what our society expected of them, don't deserve to be compared with that very small minority of people within whatever service who broke the law and who, in breaking the law, betrayed the confidence and trust that society places in all of you. And that's why I don't think there should be statute of limitations. That's a, sometimes a tough message because it's easy uh, to take a different route. In the same way, um, if we're to develop that sense of, 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 um, of long-term confidence in policing, I want a police force that does stand up and can stand up, and you can, and say that the, the PSNI is there to serve people from all backgrounds, all communities. The, the PSNI is a service committed to upholding that rule of law that we hold so dear and that you swear an oath to protect. Controversy is in the very nature of, of modern policing. Um, I'm bound to say the, the question uh, that's come up recently of Trevor Burney and uh, Barry McCaffrey, the two journalists recently, the High Court has resolved. Um, clearly, that questions will be asked about the, the role of the PS9. That, that's bound to be there, and that's why those issues of transparency and accountability to the policing board are so important in making sure that the public has confidence that the decisions that policing makes are the right decisions, or in any case, that the police have to account for the, the, those right kinds of decisions. That's not to um, challenge policing. Policing has to be independent of politicians, but policing has to be accountable to society most generally, and that's an important message. Um, but as I say, 
um, I, I repeat, in, in the end, the, the solidity of what the PSNI is now achieving, I think, is there to be seen, the, ch the, the change in Northern Ireland, even with all the challenges you face, uh, um, is, is there to be seen. Um, I do want, though, to, to come on to the, this question of, of, of policing numbers, because if you go back to my comments earlier on about, the, the, about neighbourhood policing, community policing, one of the things that I'm convinced of is that policing has not got the numbers, not, uh, not here in Northern Ireland, not in my own city region, to do the job that we expect, but nor in a period of austerity has police got the partnerships. And might you refer to mental health? Um, I've seen this many times in Greater Manchester when I was the Police and Crime Commissioner, uh, uh, the absolute certain knowledge that when somebody with, with the serious mental health issues was, um, was causing nuisance on the streets, causing nuisance maybe to their own family, um, in the absence of strong mental health service, the first people on that scene are going to be a police officer. And the amount of time police officers spend here in Northern Ireland dealing with mental health issues, and let me say this not rudely, you're not competent to do this. Um, what you are competent to do is to solve the, uh, the initial disturbance, but then to transfer to, and you ought to be able to transfer to strong mental health services, working in partnership with those services like mental health and um, working in partnership with the other um, public services means that we do need to see an end to austerity. We do need to see an end to a situation where our public services are not resourced in a way to allow you to do your job. Because in the end, um, yes, of course, we can run a blue light service that simply responds to crisis. But if we're going to solve the problems that society needs solving, policing um, does it best by working with other public agencies to, to deliver um, the, the long-term solutions, the long-term change that we need. And that, of course, does mean that we need to see the Northern Ireland Executive back in power. We need to see politicians taking responsibility for the things, whether it's in Westminster, whether it's in Stormont, for the things that you need them to do. But that, in the end, does need numbers. Now, I just want to say a few words, if I may, and bounce to, to touch on this, this question of, of, of Brexit. Um, I'm committed and I will do everything I can to prevent a hard border across the island of Ireland. There, there are those um, in both communities I know who, for the extremes, who would like to see that return to a hard border, those who were never reconciled in the first place to its, to its disappearance, those who want to see its return so that they can use this uh, as a political gambit, a recruiting sergeant for, um, uh, for, for terrorism or whatever else it may be. I want to resist that at any cost. I want to make sure that we don't return to the days when you're dealing with smuggling, but actually I don't want to see the days returning when we do see you spending more time dealing with terrorism than dealing with the normalcy of, that we expect policing to do in, in a, um, a modern society. Um, but actually, Brexit does create other challenges. It means that the, the use, for example, of things like the European arrest warrant access to things like ECRIS, the European uh, Criminal Records and Information System, um, making sure that we can work with Europol. Those things really do matter to modern policing. I think it's true that the Northern Ireland Police Service has used access to the, the arrest warrant more than any other uh, police force across the United Kingdom. We need to make sure that post-Brexit, wh whatever the outcome is, and you'll have different views on what that outcome should be, that we can still make sure we've got access to the things that make a real difference for your capacity to keep our communities safe. I want to just finish by um, saying, as I started, there are ch challenges um, to policing in Northern Ireland. Of course there are. There are challenges from the past. There are challenges um, on a day-to-day -day basis still um, of terrorism, of organised crime, of the normalcy that police forces deal with all over the United Kingdom. Um, we expect, society expects, people like yourselves, your colleagues, to take on a huge, a huge challenge, a huge burden. Um, society ought to be respectful of what you do. Society ought to recognise that, as I said before, that when crisis comes, it's you and your colleagues who will be moving forward while the rest of us are moving out of the way. So I want to conclude by giving a very sincere um, thank you to everybody for what you do and through you to your colleagues, because actually, um, policing in the modern world will always be challenged, will always be challenging. It's people like yourselves who are more professional in this generation than in any other generation of policing. People like yourselves who've changed what the, the face of policing looks like in Northern Ireland. People like yourselves who are delivering that modern police service that's fit 
for a modern Northern Ireland who deserve our thanks and gratitude. So thank you for listening, but thank you for what you do on a daily basis. Thank you.